I'm Richard Escal, and we are back on the Zero Hour. And our guest in this segment is Joseph Williams, who wrote a terrific piece as a contributor for The Atlantic. Uh, you know, one of the uh, reasons why I wanted to have uh, Joe on, besides the fact that he wrote a, a terrific and compelling piece for The Atlantic, is uh, a lot of us don't realize when we live a white collar existence how fragile in today's America that existence is for most of us, how it takes a couple missteps here and there, and pretty soon we're living a very different kind of life. And that roughly was uh, Joe's story. Uh, Joe Williams was the, he's currently interim communications director for a nonprofit group on Capitol Hill. But before that, he spent some time, as he will tell us, as in a sales associate in a sporting goods store in suburban Maryland. But he had been uh, a writer for Politico, a reporter covering the White House, Obama administration cabinet, and domestic policies, and he'd been with a number of papers before that. Great, uh, great background, and uh, one uh, series of missteps changed everything for Joe, and he wrote about that recently for The Atlantic. Uh, Joseph Williams, thanks for being with us. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, you bet. Now, you wrote a great piece where you explained that uh, you said something wrong. You were, I believe, a regular contributor to MSNBC. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Uh, basically, during the 2012 election, uh, I was asked to go on camera and talk, uh, representing Politico, and talk about uh, Mitt Romney and kind of the difficulties he's been, he's been having, had having at that time, reaching out to minorities. And part of the reason why they asked me that is because Mitt was going to up here before the National Council of La Raza, and it was the first kind of big speaking engagement in front of a minority audience. And, <clears throat> thank you, pardon, towards the end of that interview, I just mentioned, I'm um, mindful of some of the things that I've seen when Romney was running for governor and I was living in Massachusetts. Uh, he really seemed awkward around people who were of color, people who didn't seem like him. And uh, I said, and I really, I'm not sure why this is, but I said, I think the phrase white folks just really touched a nerve with conservatives and they just went ballistic on it. Uh, they scraped my Twitter account. They went all through my background, find some really interesting and, you know, things that I hadn't even thought about because they were just kind of mindless when I thought no one would ever see it because I was just some person, you know, a random reporter. And that led to political suspending me. And then I later had a separation agreement with them uh, out on the street, as it were, looking for new work. Now, they suspended you. I, I, I'm trying to, you know, your, your actual quote was Romney uh, is comfor very comfortable with people who are like him. Uh, but when he comes on Fox and Friends, they're like him. They're white folks who are very much relaxed in their own company. Now, it seems to me, look, uh, that doesn't seem that extreme to me. I mean, it seems to me, as you say, maybe the choice of white folks uh, is uh, – as words upset them, but I'm not really, this created a firestorm. I mean, this was huge. Um, and I'm not sure why, and I'm not sure why Politico suspended you. Did they tell you? They mentioned, uh, we had a meeting that afternoon, that, that, that evening rather. And in that meeting, they talked about how it was not only that, but it was about, uh, how conservatives had just basically gone through my entire background and found some things that Politico found distasteful. And in addition to that, uh, the right wing is, is very expert at whipping up a frenzy. Uh, the one thing that progressives and the left don't do all that well uh, is the way the right wing controls the message. They will focus, they will dive in deep, and it, whatever it takes, they will, they will do to make sure that they get heard, and that's part of the problem. So in, the, in essence, it was not just what I said, but it was the reaction to what I said, and uh, Politico was quite uncomfortable with, uh, with that kind of scrutiny, um, particularly from people that they had to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So even beyond that, the Romney campaign complained in person. They had, a, they had somebody call uh, John Harris, the editor. They would never tell me who that person was, but whoever it was had a, a, a enough influence to urge John Harris that this was a problem that needed to be taken care of. And so he did. And so you got fired, uh, and, and then uh, while you were looking for uh, new work in the in, in our journalism field, uh, they didn't they didn't lay off. I mean, they kept digging, according to your account, and they found that you had pleaded guilty to a, assault, assaulting your ex-wife. Is that correct? 
That's right. Um, my ex-wife and I have been, you know, we had been together for 13 years. The marriage was slowly deteriorating. Things really got bad once we got divorced. Uh, it was something that I'm really not proud of and something that, that, that's been, you know, quite embarrassing for me to admit publicly, but we did have a confrontation that turned physical. Uh, in order to put the incident behind me, I, I agreed to a uh, very, very minor punishment from the court, and halfway through completing it, the uh, gossip columnist Betsy Rothstein uh, with uh, Fishbowl DC got hold of my court file and published it, mostly because at that point I was in the public eye, and she wanted to capitalize on it and get a nice uh, headline-grabbing story and mission accomplished. So that, in essence, put this toxic cloud around me that was so bad, no one was willing to touch me at that point. And I think, you know, one of the things that I, and I assumed by your openness in, in talking about the guilty plea that, you know, you've, you've reflected on that and done whatever work you need to do to address that. So we don't need to go there. But what struck me was, um, more was the fact that in this economy, it's tough to get a job under the best of circumstances. You already had the Romney people going after you. You had the radical, the, the extreme right searching for everything they could. You had this, this count against you. So you wound up, and this is the next part of the story that I think is really important also for people to understand that once you wound up working in retail, um, uh, that's a tough life for anyone. It really is, and we so often don't even think about the people behind the counter, the people stocking the shelves. I certainly didn't, and the last retail experience I had was back in the 80s when I was a kid, and it's very easy to dismiss or overlook some of the things that you're asked or required to do, but I think that it has changed significantly from my last memory of retail experience. I mean, I don't ever remember having to be searched going in and out of work. I mean, we had to make sure the cash register came to account, but short of that, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't anything involving your personal, uh, your person and being suspected of stealing something, whether you had or not. And this is common. Uh, what, you know, the, the bag check policy is common. The search policy is common. The fact that you can't sit is common. The fact that you have cameras watching your every move is common. I mean, people are upset about the NSA now. I mean, a retail environment, you know, it, it's 10 times that bad because they're watching you and there's really nothing you can do about it if you want to get paid. So it was all part of, of, of some indignities that I had to suck up and just do. Uh, the hardest factor of it was mental because I had gone from a position where people paid attention to what I said to a place where I wore a T-shirt as a uniform and I was responsible for fetching things. So it right. really was a, a comeuppance and a, a humbling, humiliating, embarrassing experience to go from one, one part to another. What's more important, however, is the fact that people go through this every day who don't really have a choice. This is what they do. Right. And I think that you know one of the things that made your article so compelling was that because you hadn't been in that world, it's like going from an air-conditioned room to the outdoors when there's a heat wave. You feel the heat that much more when it's a, when it's a transition. And I think you felt it. I mean, you felt that. You know, for example, I've written a lot about the fact that civil liberties are suspended in the when you in the workplace nowadays. The kind of physical searches that you were subjected to, or if the company, if you had even a white collar job where the company gives you a cell phone, they track your movements inside and outside the office building and so on. This has all, you know, been tested, it's legal, and people don't walk out because they need the $10 an hour as you needed it. And so I think you made it, you know, for a lot of us, I think you made it concrete and real, those levels of indignity. So what happened then, just in the in the minute or so we've got left, uh, you have managed to escape the world of sporting goods retail, and what's going on now? Well, I have, and it was a very important lesson. I thought it was very valuable. I didn't see it at the time, but it's, it changed me, and it changed a lot of my perspective. Uh, what's going on now is I'm continuing to write about this. Uh, I'm doing some work for the Institute of Policy Studies to examine the new economy and how people have fallen through the cracks and the fact that we now have a new class that's developing, which is essentially the working middle class poor, um, which is a mishmash of terms that we haven't quite sorted out yet. But there are so many people like me. The one reaction that I had that was almost constant in the reaction that I had to the story, which is pretty big, was the fact that people were saying, yes, it happened to me. Yes, it's happened to my cousin, my brother, my uncle, my cousin, my wife. So there's a lot of stories out there that be, need to be told. I'm doing part of that on a blog, which is called uh, Joe, uh, not Joe, but uh, middleclassandbroke.blogspot.com. 
middleclassandbroke.blogspot.com. Um, people can read about some of the things that I've observed in my neighborhood and some of the things that I've observed in my transition from white collar to working class. Well, Joe Williams, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks so much for sharing your story so honestly and uh, keep up the good work. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You bet. I'm RJ Eskow. We will be right back. And this is the Zero Hour.